So who's got writing questions or things to talk about? And I'm going to ask you about how the submissions are going, Jen. So get, get that ready. Um, well, so I've been actually, I'm going to self publish my, um, city of sevens and, um, I've been working on the second one and right now, sorry for the baby noises. No, it's fine. <laughs> we like it. Um, here, Doc Ondar's her favorite toy. Um, so I've been working on the second one and I'm trying to like do all the sequel stuff and uh, that's why it's hard to write because you have something attached to you at all times <laughs> um, but I'm, so I'm trying to like work on the sequel and <laughs> I'm sorry so could you talk about sequels and what you should be like hitting on sequels wow uh you were doing so well and then you just pitched it into a big question um yeah i'd love to hear more about the self-publishing with with the book i mean as i recall yeah my relationship my understanding of like the relationship between the first book and then what would be the second book is kind of jumbled because i thought the first book got split into a couple of books so what what happened there yeah, I did split it off. And so it kind of continues on, but I kind of want to not just, just continue the storyline, but I also have like different bigger themes. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think that um, <clears throat> particularly if you're self-publishing, there's really room to think about it differently instead of just thinking about like, sequels in the sense of traditional books you can almost start thinking of it in terms of like seasons of a long-running show you know these long-running shows were like sort of based around the novel concept and so they have long-running themes and now i think you can base a novel on that like when i was doing my podcast stuff i started to think about the jack palms books kind of as seasons and i just kind of broke them up the way that felt right and I think if you're self-publishing, it makes sense to start doing some stuff on Substack. Have you been looking at that at all? Substack is a really cool um, is a really cool venue that people have been using. It's like it feels it's not like Patreon, but it it really enables monetization. It's like a combination blog and newsletter. And uh, it's the thing that George Saunders has been doing that everyone's crazy about. Like George Saunders did it on Substack, but other people I know, um, Terrell, who's here sometimes, has had a Substack for a long time. Uh, Trisha and Gail each just started one. And it's interesting, like people come on and very quickly it asks them, do you want to support this person monthly or for the year? And you can set it up so that it's like $5 a month or $7 a month, $50 a year, $70 a year. And so it really makes a monetization stream. And you have stuff that can be free there and um, stuff that can be paid. So the model that I like with that is getting people to follow your Substack, releasing some of the chapters of the book in serialized format. I think you could either record it as audio or they have this AI thing that reads it. And I don't know how you make that happen, but uh, I've heard some of the episodes that have the AI reading it and it doesn't sound bad, but you could also just like record it on your phone and put that up there with it. So then you're making the content like more accessible and you, you, you put that behind the paywall and then you have whatever you want in front of the paywall and just, post about your baby or how you're doing or how you're writing or tell people about how the process is coming with the sequel. And then as you release it, you know, you could either say like, if you are supporting the Substack at this level, I'll mail you a copy of the book signed, or 
you tell people, you know, I'm going to keep releasing it a chapter a week or two chapters a month or something like that. And if you want it, the whole story, you can buy it now. It's over here on Amazon. It's on Audible. Um, I think probably the financials work out better. Like you're not going to get, you probably work out better if you can sell them the book yourself or like do it through Substack than if you send them to those places. But <clears throat> I like it because uh, it feels there's like a really sticky element of the relationship there. Like it has a lot of automated stuff built in where if you, when you post, it sends the stuff to all the people's emails, they get it in their email, they can read the content there, they can read the comment on the blog, even if they're not um, paying for a subscription, they get posts whenever you post anything. Um, it just seems like it, it's built in well, even when I've just like gone to visit someone's thing to see how they're doing it, I keep getting emails and stuff to, to know what's going on with them. Um, and I could put out a few links to people who are doing it so that you can see how they're doing it. But I think like if I was to do it, what you're talking about, I wouldn't worry so much about like what needs to be in the sequel and what doesn't. I think you just continue, consider the sequel a, con a continuation of the first. Ideally, it should it should stand alone as well. So maybe that's really what you're what you're asking about. But I think if you're if you're engaging an audience and giving away the content on some level or putting it into this subscription model, then when you put out book two, you know, if people subscribe, they could go back and get all of book one. So it's less about the traditional marketing of like, well, book two has to be able to stand alone and be the sequel. So I think rather than thinking about it in that sense, just like really run with what excites you about the characters and their situations and just pretend like it's one big exercise for a single audience instead of like, well, this one needs to be accessible to people who didn't read the first one. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, one thing, you know, I've been kind of like reviewing because I have like 60,000 words done of the second one from like five years ago. And um, and I'm going back though. And I'm like, okay, what really excited me was like this world building and really, you know, like the kind of creative part. And when I already have it done, it's like not as exciting. And so I'm trying to go back and like, see how I can like fluff up new parts. Cause that was the exciting part for me. Yeah. I mean, I was working with you on that novel and it seems like it seemed, tell me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like you already had like a big chunk written of the second one. And then you kind of said, well, I'm going to end the first one here. Yeah. Yes. So it's just a, a matter of like rejiggering like where the climax is and what builds from there. So then you could just look at it and say, well, now I have 60,000 words of the second one. I could start putting that out in a serialized fashion. Essentially, like you have a lot of content. Like if you serialize the first book, you have a lot of content that could last you for months or a year. Then you start serializing the second book. You have a lot of content that you can put out. And the thinking is, you know, with each episode you put out, you put it out on your Facebook, you put it out on your Twitter, you ask your friends to post it. Like as the more you keep putting up content, the the more it spreads out there. And, you know, having a baby, you don't have to do all the work of like recording it and editing audio like I was doing with the podcast stuff. You could just like copy a chapter, paste it in and then do another one uh in a few weeks or a month or whatever i'm gonna put in there's a woman um sarah gail lambert she has a thriller uh that she's been doing on here on substack um and she she posts in the free section about like things about how to publish your novel or publish setting aside an unpublishable novel. 
and then she's got the chapters. <clears throat> and then she's got other writings here that are free. So she's balancing out free and not free. And all the chapters of the novel are not free. But if you, when you first go to the blog, if you don't subscribe, you get an email a few days later that says, um, if you're thinking about subscribing, here's the first three chapters of the book for free. So you can you can read the first three chapters, see if you like it, then subscribe. And then, you know, it seems like a lot of people pay per year. So when you start doing the Substack, it can give you a little bit of a, a cash infusion up front. How's the self-publishing process going? What's that look like at this point? <laughs> all right, she was good all day. That as soon as I'm on camera, she's not. There's a lot going on over here. If you want, <laughs> I can. I don't need to ask you questions if you want to. Um, baby. I just feel bad. Um, it's okay. I'm just kind of taking it one piece at a time. It's with proofreading right now, and so whenever that's done. I have the cover, I have, you know, it's been copy edited from before. So I'm just kind of, I'll hit publish and then deal with marketing later and, you know, just do little bits. And when it gets overwhelming, I'll stop and not really worry about doing, you know, a major thing. Yeah. Sounds good. Don't forget to celebrate. And I think Substack can be marketing too. Like as you're giving people content, you're telling them about the release, asking them to tell their friends about it or tweet about it or whatever. And, you know, that kind of word of mouth, if you're going back to them consistently with content, instead of like posting again and again on your Facebook or wherever that you have a book coming out, you know, it lasts longer. It feels better for people if they're getting something to engage with than just a post that says, hey, tell everyone about my book. Buy my book. Buy my book. Jen, what are you thinking? I see some gears turning over there. Oh, no, I, I have like two computers open and I'm trying to take notes on both in different sections. So I have a self-publishing plan for myself for... A short novella I'm finishing this month, hopefully, um, because it's Christmas themed and I don't want to have to write it after December. So um, I'm just I'm not even going to try to query that one. I'm just going to self-publish it. So what's going on with the querying with dragons and Salem, not Salem, yeah. um, Hartford? Yeah. Um. So I had a lot of really good luck with the dragons so far. I started querying in October and I had two requests for full reads. One was with a really good um, agent. She ended up passing on it. And then I have one. I'm still the other one. I'm still waiting to hear back from. So I think I've sent it to like everybody I would want to send it to. So we'll see if this lady comes back and says yes or no or or what will happen there. Um. So I. I've just been kind of focused on writing this novella in the meantime. Yeah. Um, I did completely change my writing process, which I never thought I would. I thought I was a pantser for life. Um, and I don't know if, if, if anybody else has a subscription to masterclass. I'm no longer a pantser. A pantser. Um, so I saw I watched a masterclass with the Doofer brothers who are the writers for Stranger oh, Things, which yeah. I'm obsessed with. It's so good. Doofer um, or Duffer? I say Doofer because it's it's more fun to say. Okay. I don't know how they really say it. I say it's the, the Doofer brothers. So they explain their writing process and they don't outline, they scaffold, which I feel like it's even like a more backed up view of what um an outline is. Like so they're their scaffold for stranger things was like a, a a boy in this friend group disappears and they have to get him back like that there's no pressure there that's like one sentence so i'm like okay that takes a lot of pressure off so i started kind of scaffolding and just like 
not having the pressure on myself to figure out every single detail or every single character Mm -hmm. was um, so much easier. And then from there, you go into like a brainstorm phase where you brainstorm, who could this friend group be? Like who, who could possibly be in the friend group? Like any blue sky idea of who could be in the friend group. And then you take like the most interesting or most appealing choices to you. And then, then from there you write an outline. Um, but this made it the whole process a lot more fun and a lot faster. Like I find that I'm writing a lot faster now, um, which is, which is good. So. So you're using that for the novella? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So yeah. Other than that, um, yeah, I was thinking about self-publishing. I have a big plan um, on what I want to do, but um, I was thinking about doing um, Amazon self-publishing and then also Ingram Spark. And then I don't know, I have a a TBD on um, ACX for Audible. I have some friends that do voiceover stuff because that's, I live in Orlando and everybody's some kind of performer. So I don't know. I don't know if it's worth it. I need to look into if there's like a business justification for if that would be worth it. So Jennifer has her hand up. Yeah. The reason I have my hand up is um, I do so many master classes that they ask me to give feedback before before they put them out for other people. Oh, cool. And so one of the ones I did feedback for was the Duffer Brothers. Mm -hmm. And it was the coolest thing to see their rough cuts of what they did. And just so you know, they were really messy, some of them. And so they seem to me like the kind of people that like, if you let them, they could just like go all over the place. And, uh, you know, of course, that class they did, there was really a lot of nuggets in there, too. Mm-hmm. But it was really fun to see how how messy and like they would go off on these bizarre tangents. And obviously, the masterclass people clean them up. But I can see why they would really need to have that structure or else who know but that's also how they get all those wild and wonderful ideas because they mm-hmm. let them and and the other thing that's really cool for the two of them is they bounce off each other and so that was really fun so you got to really see how even during the master class sessions they're like bouncing ideas off each other which I think it's kind of hard sometimes to just be writing by yourself because you're like oh what is this good? Is this a good idea or not? And it's like in the bouncing off of each other that you really could see how their process was was getting to something. But the, even in their um, rough cuts, you could just see crazy ideas that they would come out, but then they, they would encourage each other. And that, so that was really fun. But I like masterclass. I think they've got all kinds of stuff in there that you can go to different people like Shonda Rhimes will say something completely different than um, Margaret Atwood. But when you talk, when you see what both of their perspectives are, you can, there's, there's always at least something you can take away, but I'm glad it turned out good. Yeah. I've done a few too. I liked Dan Brown's um, Malcolm Gladwell. Not really. I thought he really ran off on tangents that didn't necessarily have anything to do with writing. Um, but yeah, the Duper brothers really, that one resonated with me for whatever reason. And I'm, I'm happy with the, how they do the scaffolding thing. It's working for me. So Liz did the, did you guys do the James Patterson one? I think Liz did that one. And that one, he really talked about how he uses, I don't know if he calls them outlines or what, but yeah, he really had those. Like super detailed. And so like, you know, I tried to do that. I found it kind of stifling to have it all planned out like that but I actually take so I've been you know I just finished my certificate in screenwriting and um that I use the same stuff in screenwriting that I do for plotting in in, for a novel because it kind of hits the same beats so Mm -hmm. that's been kind of similarly with scaffolding kind of at least know the major like where I'm headed and not necessarily exactly how to get there I feel like in TV, it's easier to throw out a scaffolding like that and then just say, well, here's our interesting idea for this season and we'll figure it out either as the season goes or in the writer's room when we're all pitching questions and ideas at each other. We'll just figure out what works best. Yeah. 
Yeah. The thing that I did with this experiment with Rich and those guys was cool because I could see like when I started writing it, I could see like just as far as I wanted to get in this one chapter. And then I didn't have to worry about big picture stuff because I could just get it to that place where I thought the chapter would end and then pass it off to someone else. So I felt good. How did it work to do the scaffolding and then fill it in yourself without like a team of writers to work with? Um, so I gave myself a set time period because they even go into the time period of they will scaffold for like two weeks and then they'll go into like a one month brainstorm. That's like their one month where they kick around any idea and then they clean it up for like a week. So I gave myself a timeline like that. Um, so that worked. I'm definitely, I mean, the, the, the writers uh, for Stranger Things, they're twins. So I think they have a deeper relationship than maybe even a writing partner would have. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, they grew up together. They were both Dungeons and Dragons players. So they get, you know, references. I think they can move a lot faster, or write a lot faster than normal people or even someone with a writing partner. But um, I don't know. I the story came for the novella came pretty fast. So yeah, I don't know. How did it change from the brainstorming to the writing process? It's um it's a lot easier because I, I did the scaffold, then I filled it out a little bit more and then did an outline. But I when I'm when I used to pants, I I would start writing and then I would go off on a tangent or I would discover a character I hadn't planned for. And while I liked that creativity, I would always have to go back and like rewrite the beginning to make the whole thing make sense. Um, so th this method has cut a lot of that out. So I'm, I'm not wasting as much time, like revising and revising. Cause you know, revision is not my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so this has helped save a lot of time because I have a better overall vision of what my story is and what it isn't and where I want to go and like kind of a, a railroad track of how I could stay on that path. So. Yeah. Sounds good. How about you, Julie? How's everything going there? You're muted. You're muted, Julie. I'm struggling with the revising, so I understand where Jen's coming from, totally. Um, but uh, the problem I'm having with the revising is I for those of you who haven't had Seth advise you on this, you're, he, he was very adamant that you work from your scenario that you've spent all these months putting together. together. Um, and I really truly understand the concept, but I am, the execution is extremely difficult for me because he's, he, you know, Seth wants me to work at this 75 foot altitude. So, there I am up there looking down on my paper, but you know, once I start putting words on the page, I'm right back down there on the page, and I'm and I'm I'm doing my little micro edits along with trying to do bigger scale things, and it's and I, then I go, no, no, I can't, I'm not supposed to be doing this, <laughs> and it's it's very frustrating because I, I I do understand the concept, I see what I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm having an enormous amount of difficulty actually working that way and um, so I'll, I will stick with it for because I'm everything I've stuck with if I've gotten it figured out it just takes me a long time so um, eventually I'll probably get it and I'll start just being able to go to those sections that I have said that I want to delete and X them all out and easily connect up the pieces that were you know left kind of dangling that's my problem i see these pieces dangling and then i'm trying to put them together with 
reasonable prose and and um, that's where I get back, you know, muddle back into the uh, just micro micro editing. Aspect. Are you going back and forth between the scenario and the draft, or are you just like made all these notes in the scenario and then you're making one pass through the draft based on those notes? Well, it's kind of a back and forth process. I mean, I do, I have a, one thing, I have the scenario and all, all my notes on what I plan, plan to do. And then I sit down with the, with the rough draft and I'll, I did go through and make all the, the huge edits, all the huge deletions, you know, the big deletions. But now I'm sort of in the, okay, this section needs to be shortened by 30% or something. Mm. It's just way too long. Um, my problem for everybody who doesn't know is my novel is way too long. And um, I'm trying to get it um, down, to, down to size and, and trimmed and not going off in a million different directions. So that's, that's kind of, I am, I'm finding it hard. To, to to just keep I'll always have another idea so I'm always going back to the scenario and writing in that other idea um, for what I'm going to do later on but sometimes I just want to execute that idea I've just had so and, and I so I'm sitting there working this passage which I probably really shouldn't be doing but that's my frustration Right now. Yeah, Julie's trying to go from 160,000 words down to like 100 or lower. And it's definitely one book, not multiple books. Um, yeah, that sounds tricky. I hear where you would get stuck there and you're going back and forth. And what happens? You try to execute and then you start writing and rewriting the things that you're trying to put in between? Yeah. Yeah. So if anybody has any good ideas, <laughs> I'm all ears. It's, it's, what about using placeholders? It just says, I'm going to come back and do this later. I'm going to come back and do this. Yeah, insert transition here. I do that all the time, Julie. Do you? Does it work? Can yeah. you come back and later and stick in the transition? Because... Or I'll be in the shower and then I'll think of an idea for a scene or walking my dog or waiting for my kid in the car. <laughs> and then I'll come back later. Yeah, I do it all the time. Yeah, I mean, that's probably what I should do more of. Just leave the dangling ends and, and say, you know, make these match later and go on to the next thing. Yeah, I think the concept that I'm coming from is the idea that there's just like, there's there's a place where you do like this high level stuff and then there's places where you do the low level stuff so if you can just leave that stuff the more granular work for later and just put in placeholders that sounds really effective that's what i've found to work and it sounds really challenging it is for me <laughs> I'm yeah. sort of a begin at the beginning and finish at the end type of person. So, um, because otherwise it never gets done. Yeah, but in revision, you know, you're going to have to have multiple passes. So it's a question of like, what's the goal on this pass? What am I working on? And it could be structural. And then later on, I'm going to fill in the gaps or I'm going to work on copy editing or, or cutting out extra paragraphs. <clears throat> hang in there thanks I don't know Jen do you think you have do you think you've discovered a new way to avoid revision um I think so this is technically my first draft but I would say it feels more like a middle draft so maybe I won't have to revise it as much it's also a novella like so it's not the 90,000 word beast my first book was. So um, revising this should be 
easier when I get to that point. Once I have this, this version done, I'm going to pass it off to my friend. I think I mentioned it before my T who was one of your former students. Oh yeah. Um, she quit her job. Um, she was, a a assistant editor for a middle grade girls series. Um, that's I think like party boys, sweet Valley high, like for, but for, it, for today's kids. Um, she's now on her own, um, doing work through Reedsy and she did some development. I hired, I hired her to do developmental editing for dragons and she gave like really great developmental feedback. Um, just like, you don't need this C level storyline. You don't need this extra character. It feels du- like a duplicate. Um, so I'll probably hand this version to her feeling like it's a good enough draft to pay for developmental editing. How many words is it? Um, 30,000 right now. Oh my God. Yeah. That's much easier to handle. Yeah. Much easier than 90,000. And a lot more affordable to pay for editing on. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I'm just impressed that you're still writing, getting so much done. I have a lot of books if anybody wants to buy them ever. <laughs> More than two? I mean, I have um, Widow, which I haven't like sent out since before the pandemic, I think. Um, Dragons 1 is done. Dragons 2 is started. Wow. Novella is almost done. And then I, I published that short story, Kitchen Witch, on Kindle Vella. Yeah. A while ago, like a year and a half ago. So, yeah. Good job. Um, I think we'll wrap in the next five minutes. So what other things do you guys want to touch on? Did anyone, did you guys look at the the piece from Jane Friedman about different paths to publish? What did you think about that? What's your view on that, Seth? It seems like publishing is changing so fast right now. And um, I, I just like, I just think it's so much work for the writer now no matter what you do. And even if you sell your book, they expect you to do the marketing and and the agents expect you to give up part of your um, advance for marketing. And I just find that really depressing, but what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, she's been updating this every year. I think when she started, <clears throat> there were like five paths. Now there's seven uh it's all breaking up into different different ways of doing things i think the substack version is sort of like this social one that she's talking about um i think it's just more and more reality of what's going on in the industry um you know when i published jack wakes up i thought that um i would spend a lot of my advance to do a book tour and i spent I paid to travel around the country and lined up all these readings at bookstores. And it turned out that most of the bookstores I was reading at didn't report to the New York times. And that was, or they only reported to the New York times for, for book sales. And I wasn't going to get on the New York times list because that was huge success. And, um, my publisher was in New York just watching BookScan and most of these places weren't reporting to BookScan. So none of the sales were showing up. It's just a really imperfect system and process. Um, This part down here is crazy. Most advances do not earn out. Authors don't control title or cover design. True. Authors are often unhappy with marketing support or surprised at lack of support. I would say like that is been true for so many people that I've seen publish and it's something that really sneaks up on people and they don't think like I thought that uh, 
Jack Wakes Up would be in all the bookstores, all the Barnes and Nobles, and that would really lead to a lot of sales. Um, the lack of support was surprising to me. Jen, are you are you going to publish on Kindle Unlimited, or what are you going to do for your novella? Uh, yeah, I'm going to do um Amazon and Ingram Spark, okay. so that puts it in um Walmart.com, Target.com, BarnesandNoble.com. Yeah, yeah, that's what. So what, right now, I'm trying to like I think I will eventually put in on Kindle Unlimited for the ebook. But then if you do that, you can't publish an ebook or probably do the Substack stuff if you put it in Kindle Unlimited. So I don't know. Why is that? It, it's just in their terms. A rule. You know? yeah, that's a what, weird rule. What does it say? You can't publish. If you're in Kindle Unlimited, you can't have an ebook anywhere else. Oh. And so you can still do print on like Ingram or whatever, but you just can't do ebook or serialized anywhere or any little snippet it used to do 10 percent. you couldn't have more than 10 percent, but they changed their terms and it's just any amount now so but the thing is that if you do yeah so you have to weigh out like if you even if you do kindle unlimited well whether you do kindle unlimited or not if you publish the ebook in other places then um, the percentage at Amazon changes. So you have to figure out how much you think you're going to sell at barnesandnoble.com and all these other ones. Some people talk about, well, oh, Kobo is really big in Australia. You'll sell in the UK if you're on Kobo. And I just never bothered with that. I just figured like the percentages are better on Amazon. I think it's like 40%. It's like 40 if you're everywhere and 70% if you're not. And so I just left it that way. And it just feels like it's one less thing to worry about. And Kindle Unlimited, I think, is good because they, you get paid for all the reading that happens there. You get paid like per page or something. So it's not bad. I don't know. Like, it sounds good to be on walmart.com and target.com is that only for the hardcover or is that for the ebook i was going to do paperback and ebook i haven't looked into ingram spark that much um that's just what i some of my other published friends have did. that's the route they've gone have they gotten sales on walmart and target um i don't know i haven't asked i should probably ask i put why did I do this? I put the Maltese Jordans on Ingram Spark so that it, because <clears throat> you have to do that if you want to get it into libraries. Uh, and um, I think literally it's like $15 on there and I get $1 when they sell a copy. So it's like maybe on Amazon, I would get like three or $4 for, for a paperback sold maybe a little more even. And Ingram is like, you have to pay to have it on there. Uh, it takes them a lot longer to fulfill and pay. And the the royalties there are like non-existent. Yeah, I've been, um, I don't know if you've heard of this guy, but I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos um, by Dale, where's his last name? Dale... L. Roberts. Mm. All he does, he is big into YouTube about the business of self publishing. Mm -hmm. And he weighs a lot of these, um, a lot of the different options and ways to go about it. And he seems to be pretty knowledge, more knowledgeable than me, at least. <laughs> so I've been watching a lot of him. As and he's well. saying, do Ingram Spark? Um, I think his number one is Amazon. Right. But if you're sure. going to do both. Yeah. I think, like, I think he, in one of his videos, I think he evaluated like eight or 10 methods, like pros and cons for both, for all of them. Um, yeah. I think the question though, is just like, do you do Amazon and the others? Yeah. Because if you do the others, then it lowers your royalties for sales on Amazon. Yeah. 
Hmm. So it's all to think about. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if, uh, Jen, if you or Liz want to, if you guys want to talk about this more as you go down the self-publishing thing, I can tell you what it's been like for me or give you advice. I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but it never felt to me like, oh, if I do these other routes, I'm going to get that much more sales there. And so it's worth doing it. It just feels like if I send all my, you know, if I'm, if I'm promoting the book and I can sell it through my website, then I can make a good amount or I can promote it through Amazon and I can make a few bucks. But, um, yeah, I don't know. When you fulfill on your website, where are you getting the print copies from? The stack in my closet. But like who public like was that from Amazon originally or did you have like a different press or no I did um other copies from that I just did it through Amazon the way we did with ground. Like you can go in and author order author copies and so they're like four bucks each. And then if I sell it on my site for twenty bucks and I can use PayPal to like print out the postage thing and then just stick that on the um envelope, I don't have to go to the post office or anything. Just shove it in the mailbox. And the little postal carrier man takes it. I mean, he's big, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of good questions. I'm glad that we're talking about publishing. I'm glad that you guys are going out there and doing it. Let's keep talking about it. I would uh, be happy to get into more of that. Maybe we'll do that in January at another office hour. Thanks for coming out, you guys. It's good to see you. Happy holidays. Uh, I hope you have a great Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's, all the things. Joy. Is River asleep? No, she's so cute. She's been talking this entire time, so that's why I had myself on mute. Oh. Nobody, nobody is going to get upset for cute baby noises. We actually love that, Liz. Yeah. We're deprived of that. Okay. Now she's just staring at us. Well, she sees, I think she sees everybody, so it's pretty exciting. Yeah, we're exciting. Hey. Yeah. Look at everybody's there. 